the most devastating is probably the sharks. I mean, in 1947, there were so many sharks around in Kentucky that they didn't think twice about fishing and, and killing 20 sharks. So that's how you fish with a shark with your hands. Uh, and then you have to get away because... <laughs> the rope is free! What? The rope is free! Ah, shit! Liam's fallen into a crevasse, and I immediately thought he's dead, or at least seriously hurt. And my guts had been ripped out of my body and were being contained by my flight I suit. I know a mountain lion is on top of me. Welcome to another episode of the World of Entertainment Podcast. I'm your host, Vinny Two Crocs. Okay, today I did something a little different. Instead of having a first-hand story like we typically do on the podcast, I decided to have a little blast from the past. In my opinion, this is historically one of the greatest adventures embarked by humankind. So, pretty big feat. Actually, they say that man going to the moon was inspired in some sense, shape, or form by the Kantiki Expedition. So, that's what we're talking about today, the Kantiki Journey a 4,320 nautical mile journey on a raft from Peru to Polynesia in 1947. So that's what we're talking about today. And we were very fortunate to get probably the most educated person on the matter, the curator at the Kontiki Museum in Oslo, Norway. So tune in on YouTube. You get to see the Kontiki raft. The museum's closed right now because of COVID, so we got a little sneak peek. We're the only people that got access to the museum for this incredible story. So again, the Kontiki journey told by my now friend, Radar Solsvik. I pronounce your name Radar Solsvik, correct? Yeah, that's far better than I pronounce it. So. Is it? <laughs> I have <laughs> a speech awesome. impediment, uh, so I can't really pronounce R, so I say Raidog, but mm -hmm. most of the people I met uh, calls me Radar, so it's so it's perfect. Everyone that runs a podcast seems to have a speech impediment of some type. I stutter. <laughs> it's totally counterintuitive. You were saying it's really cold in the museum right now because you have COVID. You guys closed it down? Yeah, we closed down first time in uh, April last year, and then we had the summer open, uh, and then we closed down again in September. And okay. when the winter is gone, uh, you know, we, we laid off some people, we, uh, and the biggest expense here in Norway during the winter is the electricity bill. I think we saved like at least $100,000 just to close down the electricity. A hundred thousand dollars is what you guys pay. Oh, and the museum is large because you're hosting a boat. It's about two but... two thousand square meters. Uh, yeah, it's not, not that, that large, but the problem is like it's one giant room. It's not sectioned into small rooms, so you can close off the doors and stuff. Yeah, it's just two big halls for each of the crafts. Balsa log behind me, the balsa raft. And then we have a reed ship in the other room. Is that the, the one that's spelled Ra or R-A? Yeah. Yeah, I, re I read about that one as well. I think I got um, the two expeditions a little like commingled at one point. It was kind of cool and I had to like <laughs> decipher that. Yeah. But anyway, for all those uh, tuning in on YouTube, Radar's standing behind. He's got the best backdrop we've ever had and it's the Contiki boat. It's there. It's behind him so you guys can check it out. It's made out of balls of wood. I'm excited because to me, this is like one of the most historic and most renowned adventures of all time. Uh, there's r rumor that it even inspired the folks to go on the moon. Is, it, is that accurate? I don't know. I don't think they inspired people to go to the moon, but I do know, and I see in the documentation, that NASA actually asked Heyerdahl if they could have a conversation between Neil Armstrong on the moon and Thor Heyerdahl sailing the raw, uh, crossing the Atlantic. That was in 69. Um, Oh, Unfortunately, wow. Heyerdahl said, no way. <laughs> why yeah. Why didn't you want to talk to Neil Armstrong on the moon? I think he wanted, but his co-pilot, Norman Baker, an American, thought it was too much drama. <laughs> and uh, yeah, also they had to be trailed by an American uh, warship. And I don't think they liked the optics of that. Oh, uh, yeah. Not because it was a warship. I mean, Heyerdahl served during the Second World War, but because they wanted to be alone. They wanted to show the world that these people didn't get help. We crossed the ocean alone. And if you trail by a big, big warship <laughs> half the way, people will ask questions. Did they really uh, keep to themselves? You know, they didn't get any help, not a bottle of wine, you know, 
<laughs> that's <laughs> true. Like and, that. and that's a different story for the Contigi, which we'll get into. That was the first raw expedition in 69, and they had to abandon the ship on the very day that Neil Armstrong touched down on the moon. So they wouldn't be able to do it anyway. Whoa. Yeah. Why did they have to touch down that ship? It fell apart. The, uh-huh. the construction wasn't uh, quite up to speed. This is a reed boat with, with reeds stuck into each other and then lashings around it to keep it together. But they had drift anchors, which pulls on one yeah. end. So they kind of just pulled one part of the boat and then all the reeds just fell out. Mm. So about a week sail from, uh, from Barbados, they, they abandoned the ship. And then because they didn't reach the goal, Harold thought people will always say that I didn't make it. So he made another one the next year and sailed <laughs> again. <laughs> so for, for those that are, are tuning in, I don't really know the Contigi story. Thor Herdal. So he's the expedition leader of the Contigi. We're talking about the other expeditions he's been on. So let's get back to our story here, sure. the Contigi. Again, this is to me, one of the most epic adventures of all time, especially the fact that this is done in 1947. I think what uh, arose the imagination of the people. You had five years of war. Uh, Europe was war-torn. All the factories in America produced war material, and people were sick and tired. Russia was devastated. A large part of Asia was devastated. And here you had some adventure. You know, in 1947... The diaries of Anne Frank, a Jewish woman who hid from Germans in their in a secret room in her apartment and then was uh, captured and eventually killed during the Holocaust. That book was issued in 1947. The first UFO sightings that got national attention in America was sighted in New Mexico just a couple of weeks before the Contiki raft landed in the Pacific. So all these stories about extraterrestrials and UFOs caught on in 1947. It was stories. People who who like thought that the technology would take them to the stars, they were talking about UFOs. And then you had people going back to the roots, back to history, and saw this uh, Boswell log raft with six people on it fighting the natural environment, the waves, the wind. They just thought it was amazing. So I think uh, different people at the time care for different stuff. Uh, and um, the ones who, who wanted outdoors adventure, who wanted history, they were set on fire by the Contiki expedition, basically. Well, what's incredible about this expedition, it is a quest to determine a historical past, right? So basically, yeah. it was also always thought that the Polynesian islands were colonized or inhabited from Asia. So people migrated from Asia. And the whole theory behind this expedition, correct me if I'm wrong, was to determine that potentially Polynesia was not colonized or inhabited from the West in Asia, but in fact from the East in South America. And I think like with the Incas. Yeah, basically the pre-Incas from uh, the, the area around Peru, Ecuador, and Herdal had been to Fatuhiva in the Marquesas, which is more or less midway between uh, Hawaii and Tahiti. Uh, and he, he kind of got interested in this point. Where did the Polynesian come from? Because that was the kind of the big mystery, the, 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 the last mystery in anthropology, kind of. Um, and he had seen some statues carved on, uh, on uh, the neighboring island called Hivoa that looked fairly similar to statues carved and erected in um, San Augustine in Colombia. Mm. And he began researching you know, local leg- legends about where they came from. And later he researched South American legends. And he found this legend about a cultural hero like he wasn't a god he was like a man who inspired some of the culture that, that's the story the, the the people telling the, the the spanish conquistadors and they say that his name was contiki vigacocha foam of the sea and he just left peru uh, on the coast and sailed out into the pacific and i heard i'll use that legend as an inspiration for the theory 
that the people in Polynesia were settled from South America. The reason he undertook the expedition was that when he went back to America, to New York, trying to talk to scientists, because he didn't have a university degree. So he just couldn't write a book about it. He tried to, but publisher didn't want to publish it. And um, the same argument came popping up, you know. The languages show that um, these islands were populated from the West. The archaeology shows that the people in South America didn't have any boats, any rafts that could reach Polynesia. Right. So that's his only way to, to, to make people listen and to read <laughs> his book, take him seriously, was to show that, no, no, these rafts were seaworthy. They could cross. 8,000 miles of ocean and end up in Polynesia. Is it, it you said 8,000? I thought it was four. It's, yeah, it's 4,000. But, but okay. when you sail and the, the, the current, and you, you cross more ocean. Oh, wow. But, but yes, you're correct. Yeah. So just so people understand the geography that we're speaking of here. So you're saying he found a statue on which island in Polynesia? Uh, Hivoa in the Marquesas. Okay, and where is Which is, is that midway that between... Know? Hawaii and uh, Tahiti. Okay. So it's under the equator, more or less. You have okay. a small group of islands called the Marquesas. Yeah. The Polynesian Islands. This is ignorant. Um, I don't. I don't quite. I don't even know where Tahiti is. Where is that again? <laughs> Tahiti is is back in the center of the Pacific. It's midway okay. between South America and Asia. Oh, okay. If you have a globe, you just turn it around until you see nothing but ocean. Because the okay. Pacific covers almost half the globe. Okay. Uh, and you see, if you have a good globe, you can see some small islands coming out from the west. But on the eastern part, you don't really see islands. The islands are way too small. Mm. Uh, with the exception of Australia and New Zealand, which is like southwest. Kind of. Right. Okay. So Polynesia is... Uh, it's all the islands. If you take a, draw a triangle from Hawaii down to Easter Island or Rapa Nui, as yeah. it's named today, and then back to New Zealand and up to Hawaii. That's Polynesia. And Easter Island? It's uh, west of Chile. Yeah, that's embarrassing. I, I think I knew that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I don't know. It seems so outrageous to think of navigating. So, we're talking about what years that potentially these South Americans traveled. So, somewhere around the year zero. To, okay. to AD 500. Oh. It's a Stone Age technology, which means they didn't know metal. And they navigated at least stretches. And they probably navigated by looking at um, the stars. 2,000 kilometers in one way. And it's the ultimate navigational task on the Earth. It was also the last, except from maybe parts of the Arctic, like Greenland, this was the last place on earth that was populated. These islands. Whoa. Polynesia, yeah. Because it was so difficult to get there. Uh, if you go west into the Pacific, you go come to New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and towards Java and Southeast Asia. And between those islands, there's open waters with about 300 kilometers. So you can almost see the next island from the island you're standing on. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. If not visually, you can see that there's rain clouds above it or, you know, you see evidence of land. When you go out into Polynesia past Fiji, it's not possible that the islands are too far apart. And the level of navigation of technology these people have and, and in a way still has is incredible. Well, it's not just incredible as far as the navigation aspect, just the setting off, just leaving the pier. <laughs> it's not a pier back then, but leaving the beach. Because, yeah. I mean, you can almost compare it to Columbus, but in a sense, Columbus seems so underrated in comparison to setting off. And I'm guessing that was balsa wood then as well, just setting off in a raft out to the ocean without seeing or knowing what's out there. What was like in their mind in your in your theory to do something like that? I don't know. Herod all uh, really, really believed in the theories of the past, in the legends that he heard. Uh, and it, he also believed in the logic of his theory, which is kind of a bit arrogant. I mean, 
uh, there's always a possibility that you're wrong and, uh, and later research proved that even though it's possible for South American Indians to travel out into the ocean, it doesn't seem that they did it with maybe one exception. So he could have been wrong, but he just had a very firm, firm belief. And I think also the fact that these people have just uh, been through a world war. I mean, two of the people on the raft were part of the special forces command. For Norway? For Norway, but they, they were educated in England. Okay. Uh, Herdal had a, a job during his army service. He was training people in silent killing. What is silent killing? Uh, killing people without them knowing that you're there. Sneaking up. Yeah. Basically he's an, he's what you see on films. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, <laughs> yeah. so Herdal, he had killed you, you people have, and you, he was training people no, too? No, he, he, okay. he, he never did that. He, he was just exceptional through training. Uh, and was very exceptional in teaching people. And you can see that in his book, he's exceptional in explaining a problem. I mean, why did Kontiki become popular? Yes, you have the, the, the Second World War and you have people looking for stories, but you also have a guy who knows how to put together a story and, uh, and get like plumbers in England interested in where did the pollution come from or <laughs> railway workers in America <laughs> or nurses in Norway. We have letters in the archive from all these people mm -hmm. and teachers, kids, you know, who made their own rafts and uh, went to the nearest river to test it. It's this ability to, to tell stories, to engage people. Mm. But two of the, the, the guys, they were commandos and, and they participated, they did much more in the war. And it, it's these kind of people that determined and they believe in their own ability to solve any kind of problem yeah and we i want to get into the crew dynamics because it was an interesting crew that said you you kind of piqued my interest as far as this silent killing what <laughs> what was thor's i mean I don't, I don't understand what that quite means as in you know they they kill during battle then you have snipers which is a, a very common term in, in today's movies that kill from a distance and then you have uh, special forces soldiers that have to basically sneak up to a soldier that's on guard duty. And then you have to dispose of him without making a sound. Mm. Because if you make a sound, the next guard will hear it. So basically that involves a knife and this region of the body, the, the neck, okay. different that's... ways of doing it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's insane. That's that's yeah. I didn't know that that the expedition leader was uh, training folks to do do that. That's and that also sounds very like Hollywoody and uh, what's that movie there with Tarantino um, and Glorious Bastards. It feels like almost yeah. like a one of those type of situations. All right, but let's get back to to the expedition. So the, again, so the purpose is to to prove his point that it was possible that Polynesia was colonized from moving through the currents westward yeah. so from it, it was very specific it, yeah. it, it, it was very specific it was to prove that these kind of rafts that you see behind me balsa wood rafts that were in use in peru up to the 40s you can find them on the beach that they were capable of crossing an ocean uh, because that was the main objection the main argument against his theory at the time now are you saying the balsa wood was available on the beach? Because I know for the Ra, the other boat that we were just talking about, they had issues with finding that balsa wood. They had to travel deeper into, uh, was it like Quito or something? Um, no, no. In the rainforest. They had, a, they had problems with that when it came to Contiki as well. Okay. But, but you could find old rafts that were still in use on the coast of Peru. Oh, okay. A and basically, that's, that's the reason why it was a problem. Because the fishermen, you know, you, you build a boat and then it has a lifespan. Even a regular rowboat, you use it for 60 years and the wood is getting rotten. So they used the balsa lug raft. And when it came time to replace it, the industry had taken over the, the coastal areas of Peru. So it was balsa wood plantations. Now the fishermen are way too poor to go and buy balsa wood. 
And besides, it's not the quality that they would like. They walk into the jungle and find the right tree and chop it down and make a raft. So they just kept on using old rafts so that it was almost sinking. And then they just put it up on the beach for two weeks, drying it out. And then they were using it for two weeks and then they were drying it. Mm. So it was uh, uh, a result of um, people getting poor and the resources were taken off by business. And then archaeologists came and asked them, how long can you use this raft? And they said, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But because this raft you can only use for two weeks, right? So, so he had to go up into Ecuador, into Quito, as you said, and find the timber that was en route and was not part of the plantation because they were bigger. And they was they weren't barked at the time. So yeah, and just collecting those materials that that balsa wood was an uh, expedition in itself. I don't want to get into that one because that's a, again that's a story in itself. Yeah. But I do want to like, what's the balsa wood actually look like? I don't think I've ever witnessed it. Could you describe it a little bit? Because it is kind of a unique tree. It's classified as a hardwood, but it is the lightest wood that uh, you can find. So. Basically, if you have a big chunk, you, you can lift it like a Superman <laughs> when it's dry. So it's very porous. Uh, it, it looks like birch, but it's way more porous. So water is getting faster up and down. I can show you after. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Like, I don't want to get too much in the construction of the raft because it is amazing. And the fact that they really try to build it as comparably to back in those days. So I guess you're saying the year zero using those similar materials. That, that, that as much was Hayard as main, uh, main point. If yeah. you build it as the Indians did, you can make it. If you try to build it with European uh, iron uh, thread or, or whatever, it won't work. Okay. So basically you just take a number of logs and tie them together. And you have to have an odd number, like three, five, seven nine or eleven and when you look at it it really is just a raft with a large sail so it kind of looks like a viking ship again check it out on youtube put some visuals and then you're standing behind it's it the there, easiest the so. uh, easiest cargo vessel you can ever build Let, let's get into the expedition because that like this is the adventure podcast so we want to get into what went out yeah. at sea so again this expedition it sets off april 28th 1947 and what they're oh. about to embark on is a 4,320 nautical mile journey. So again, 4,000, yeah. over 4,000 nautical miles. And it took them 101 days. So they leave from Calo, Peru to Moto yeah. Islands, is it, in Polynesia? Tuamoto Island. The island itself was Ragoya. It's a group of islands called the Tuamotos. Okay. Uh, very close to Tahiti. Last night I watched the film as well because I did my own actual research, but then I was like, you know what? I need to watch the, yeah, I need to watch the the actual motion picture by uh, by Harvey Weinstein, I guess the Weinstein Company at the time. What did you What did you think of the movie? I don't know. Uh, had to like it because uh, we, we we participated in the making of it. The actors actually, uh, the 2012 film, the actors actually sat outside my office to to read through the manuscript. Oh, uh, cool. It's the only film that uh, have my name on the credit but you have to sit like 17 extra minutes in the theater to see it <laughs> it's more oh, or less really? the last name on the on the credit list <laughs> gotcha the, the movie itself i think it's uh, nice but it's very typically norwegian it, it's okay. a kind of caught in between henry gibson style of uh, theater and schwarzenegger action movies it okay. tries to be a sophisticated action movie and i think uh, that's the the weak part but the story itself is great it's very accurate for most okay. of the uh, movie well uh, so we'll get into again our main main character here our main hero is thor Herdal. uh one thing i thought was kind of unique was when they're introducing all the characters uh and they're about to set off and they they address their leader, Thor, and he makes a joke about his ego. Would you say he it takes like a certain <laughs> amount of ego to set off on something like this? I think it takes a tremendous amount of ego. 
But the ego in a good sense. I mean, he actually had some friends in New York where he planned the expedition. So, so I used to say that, oddly enough, this is Norwegian expedition, but it's the classical American story, the, the little guy against everyone else. And it was organized and planned in America between Washington and uh, New York. And he was sitting beside these guys, who was a rich guy, beside the swimming pool and uh, read New York Times. And he said, you know, next year, I will be on the bestseller list. My book will be on the bestseller list. So he had ego. It took three years, not one year, <laughs> uh, three and a half. But um, on the other side, when he was actually on the raft, he didn't never took, uh, he didn't have that kind of ego that he had to tell people what to do. So it was a democracy in a way, very real one. Every this dangerous decision were talked through and uh, they never did anything on his expeditions that the people didn't agree on. There's an expedition leadership quote that says, an okay leader, his crew at the end of the journey will go, he led us to success. But a good leader at the end of the journey, his crew will go, we did this ourselves. I, I kind of resonate with that as far as a good leader puts trust into his crew. And yeah, it's not somebody that's necessarily micromanaging or a, a dictator. It's somebody that puts trust. And if you give trust, then people want to uphold that trust. And I, I feel like something like that might have happened on this expedition. I mean, I think that was the basic characteristic of Torreiro's leadership. Uh, first, the ability to talk people into abandoning everything, their wives, their family, their economy, and join the expedition. Because after two hours with Herdal, you believed what he believed. So he found the right people. Uh, usually he found them like he, he just met them. He saw the qualities and talked them into joining his expedition. So he was a good salesman too? He, he was the best salesman, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he wrote a book that... Um, stayed well i think it was 54 weeks on new york's times special list for nonfiction. Huh. sold at least 20 million copies maybe 50 million copies it's translated into 72 languages he was a good pr guy he, he but he was also a very serious guy and was a very capable guy and he treated people as you would treat your friends basically well, speaking of yeah. his friends, let's talk about the other crew members. I do want to know how he kind of selected them and then what were their various duties on the craft? Well, there were six altogether, including him, yep. uh, five crews. Uh, one was in charge of scientific measuring. They, they, they collected weather da data uh, and stuff. One was in charge of um, supplies and two people were in charge of uh, the radio. Um, and the last guy was uh, in charge of navigation. Okay. So, so one of these guys, the navigation guy, he was an uh, old-time friend from, from childhood, from uh, his hometown. And they had uh, spent a lot of uh, trips together in the Norwegian mountains, so he knew what he was made of. And he knew that he could spend three months with him without <laughs> getting bored. And that was Herdal's main concern because he could always find people that was capable of doing what he asked. But the main reason was that, uh, I think you, you mentioned something like expedition sickness. Yep. Uh, if you stay together too long and you don't have a creative mind or you don't have uh, humor, uh, you tend to nag each other. And uh, this was Herdal's first and foremost demand for, for the crew that they were interesting people that uh, were good humored. If they couldn't tell a story, out. <laughs> That's so, and then he, he made sure that people didn't talk to each other too much before the expedition. So he brought everyone together from different corners and, and they joined. But of course they had qualities. 
uh, two of the guys he, he picked up from the, his army duties. They were special commandos uh, uh, in charge of radio. Uh, one guy, he, he actually became the first director of this museum. He also had uh, the, uh, signal, the signal intelligence of Northern Norway for 10 years. Um, uh, and he, he is the highest decorated soldier in Norwegian history. Hmm. So that tells you a little bit about the qualities of the man. Why was he the highest decorated? Because he participated in uh, a lot of actions during the world, Second World War. Hmm. So he got a lot of medals. Uh, second part is that he became director of museum and he participated in, in the Kontiki expeditions. Every time he received state leaders that wanted to see the museum, he got an award. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. so it was two reasons why he became the highest tech grade. And the other one, he was radio operated during the war in Norway. And this guy was so cheeky, you know, that he, when he wanted to send radio messages, he went over to the, uh, the, the Nazi camp the, where they had their radio transmitter and he hooked off their antenna put their antenna into his radio, transmit it, and then change back. So they could never trace him what? because he used their own equipment. Yeah, he, he's one cold dude. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no nerves. So that's kind of people who, who make a successful expedition. Yeah, you know, I did like a, this Knowles course and whenever I set out on any type of expedition or adventure, that's usually always what you search for is somebody that you can share a laugh with because well a it's going to make it more fun but b it, it truly makes things it can make things more dangerous if there's that hostility that grows over time and that happens pretty quickly yeah. depending on the character that you have so i think it is insanely important especially mm -hmm. if you're out at sea for three months on a raft so the stakes are high to say the least but on top of that yeah you want you want the dynamics to be um, uh, strong they, they they kind of had two really dangerous moments on the raft. The first one happened after a couple of weeks. They were uh, riding in uh, nine meter high waves. And I don't know if you can see the top of the roof, but the top of the mast is nine and a half meters above the raft. The raft itself is maybe half a meter above the sea level. So you basically, you're sailing a raft that's small enough to go in between these um, wave crests. So what they saw was a wall of water in front of them that was nine meters high. And then they turned around and you could see a wall of water behind that was nine meters. And they were waiting for this wave to crash down on the raft. But luckily, I mean, uh, that's why you need balsa wood because it floats. Huh? I mean, maybe you have been fishing with, um, I don't know what you call it in English, but there's something floating on the water. Bobbers. So when the fish bites, bobbers. Yep. Yeah, and they kind of float on top. So, so when the wave was about to crash down, the, it, the, the, the raft is slowly gliding on top of it instead. Okay. So the only problem they really had was water breaking in at the stern, not at the front. Okay. But that was quite an uh, experience because, um, well, the, the raft turned sideways and uh, it almost, <laughs> it was almost um, beaten out of existence. Wait, you mean it flipped upside down? Is that what you mean by sideways? No, no, but it almost did. It almost oh did. If they hadn't been able to steer it back. How do they steer it back? Probably um, adjusting the sail. Uh, they don't really say because... The raft, they didn't know how to steer the raft, really. So they kind of had a rudder. But that was a flimsy thing. It was, uh, you know, to steer a canoe or something, a really big canoe. Uh, so that broke in the first hard wave. The Incas and the pre-Incas, they sailed these rafts by, with, with guara boards. That's like when you have a board which you stick in between the logs. And you have like at least five of them spread around on the aft and in the, uh, in the front. So you, you kind of set up the raft sailing into the wind uh, with the sail. So if you just push down the, the guara boards in the stern part of the raft, 
uh, it would start swinging because the pressure on the side of the raft is changing. Right. So the, the, the Incas and the pre-Incas, they just steered it with these squirrels. But the Contiki guys, they never bothered to learn that before they set off. <laughs> so my guess is that they had to adjust with a uh, drift anchor and with a sail. And for those that don't know, a drift anchor is, yeah, you're basically just dragging a bag or some kind of net just to create that drag so you're keeping in that straight line. But that was incredible. I read up on that as far as the old ways of navigation, just, yeah, basically putting these vertical planks in and pulling one or two or three out of these five in different locations to keep yourself in line. It sounds so rudimentary to navigate like that, to just... Yeah, you, it's basically just like putting your hand in the water yeah. and, you know, creating a little drag in a specific way. It sounds complicated, yet so simple. But it's extremely interesting if you compare it to the sailing technology that discovered America, or you said Christopher Columbus. I mean, both the balsa rafts, the big balsa rafts, uh, Kuntiki is a medium-sized raft. Uh, but the big balsa rafts and even the big double canoes that the Polynesians used sailing into Polynesia were just as big as the Santa Maria, if not larger. And uh, the reason why we know that uh, the, the how to construct a balsa wood raft is that two Spanish officers in the 17th century wrote a report to the Spanish Navy saying, hey, why don't we start using these rafts? Because you know, there's a reason why there are so many Spanish gold treasures. First of all, they plunder South America and all the gold. Second of all, there's a lot of hurricane around Florida and California. <laughs> but thirdly, the, the, the um, Spanish ships were not very stable. Mm. When you see paintings of them, they're really high on the front and in the stern. And they're not good sailors. They, they, they go a lot from side to side. And they capsize. But the balsa wood raft could never do that. And it could carry more load than the Spanish uh, boats. So these officers, they, they kind of asked the Navy to build balsa wood rafts. And they were even better to navigate, they said. It's easier to navigate them than these big uh, uh, Spanish boats. Interesting, because it's yeah, so light. Yeah, because it sounds very counterintuitive. But if you just adjust the guar boards like 10 centimeters, it will shift very little and you can be very precise if mm. you master the technique. Yeah. Now, this balsa wood though, I'm assuming it comes with some cons. I know you're saying it's light, but were we talking about the fact that it gets waterlogged quickly? Was that a factor, a risk that they were encountering? Yeah, th that's what the experts said. And that's what they feared. And uh, they really didn't know until like week three of the expedition because the first two weeks the, the 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 logs were soaking in water and getting waterlogged the main problem however was that the outside part of the log got soft like spongy and they could break it off and if you break it off and drop it in the sea they saw that it was sinking <laughs> so like two weeks into the expedition they had serious doubts about whether this uh, we would survive this but luckily that stopped about 10 centimeters in. And what that proved to, what proved to be a ingenious way of protecting the rope that you, you tie the logs together because there's a lot of movement in between the logs. And if you had used just hardwood like oak, the ropes would be gnawed off and mm. the rough would fall apart. Um, a technique the Incas actually did to, to, to uh, if they didn't like the Spanish <laughs> during the conquest of Peru, you have instances where the Inca sailors cut the ropes so the logs will move away from each other and you drop into the sea and the, the Spanish couldn't swim, the Incas could. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Smart people. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the movement of the logs will ignore the, the ropes, but this um, 10 centimeters of sponge protected the ropes. Yeah, it would allow it to sink in and absorb it more. 
Mm. So it was basically protecting the road. So that's how it held together. And if you think about the construction phase, the, the fact that it was um, crossing the Pacific, then it was brought back to Norway and they put it outside uh, the, the harbor of Oslo. And it stayed in the harbor for a year, almost a year. Later, experts have researched this and they say that the reason balsa wood logs don't soak too much water and sink is that they, they contain a level of liquid when you cut them. And it would take about two to three, four years maybe before they sink. So oh, they okay. can float for a long time. I was just picking up this. Oh, wow. Yeah, that looks like a sponge. That looks like a dry sponge. It looks yeah. so light. And it's incredible. So, oh, wow. Yeah, that looks like that would make you feel strong to carry those logs. And I do recall, or I forget what I was reading, but yeah, talking about, I think, I think it was when the Europeans first got there and they were seeing all these South Americans and they, they thought they were so strong because they were carrying these big logs, but they were yeah. just probably... Yeah, those light, that light wood. Could be, could be, yeah. Let's, let's get into the expeditions because a lot of times we, we do like to talk about like survival tactics. So I, I want to get yeah. into what it was like out at sea. So unlike the Ra, which was tailed by a Navy ship, the Contiki expedition, they were on their own. So when they set out with Both, this... both were on their own. They, 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 uh, they had the option of having a naval ship towing the, the Ra, but... They chose not to. So for the Contiki, they had an option to have a backup, but they chose not to. No, no, uh, the raw because oh, the raw, of the yeah, radio. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as the Contiki, though, there was, n there was no one out in the ocean with them. No, they, they were actually towed, towed uh, with a boat out to sea, and they didn't see any people or another ship until they reached the Polynesian Islands. As well. Oh, my God. And this is 1947, and... This was not very close to, to, to the traditional shipping lanes. So they would not have been rescued if uh, something went wrong. So would you say everyone on the crew was on the same page that there's a good chance they're not going to survive? I think they were on the same page as far as there's a chance that they're, we're going to face something really tough and we might not survive. But I think most of them thought that Hey, we we can make it. <laughs> okay, yeah. We made it. Through, we made it through the war. We we will make this as well. So, was there any sort of backup? They had communications, right? So, they so had like telegraph. Radio. Okay. Uh, they had several radio sets, uh, in particular for emergencies. They had two two emergency radio sets: one for normal communication, one for communicating with planes. Okay. And then they had a third radio set uh, for communicating with the media, uh, sending stories. So they were both talking to people and using uh, Morse key. Well, let's get into the radio first, because how does that work? Is it back then it's just still antennas? Like they are able to reach land so far away? I'm not an expert, but, um, but they did have equipment that would reach American and uh, would have been tested. And they had radio stations that were listening to them. They were also, it turned out that the American um, Navy had developed radio radar that they, they could pinpoint the location of um, a vessel by listening into their radio transmissions. Unfortunately, that was top secret at the time, so it wouldn't have been in use for finding them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they 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 were told this years after the fact. <laughs> okay. um, but no, basically they had a radio uh, and they communicated very close to Peru. There was kind of a like a zone that uh, stopped radio signals, and they were in what they call radio shadow. Oh yeah. Uh, but once they got out to sea they could reach quite many different radio stations. They, of course, had to have antennas. They had one antenna in the mast, but they also had uh, radio balloons that you fill with the hydrogen. Uh, and there's like a system, military system, where you put a cylinder down into the ocean and uh, the water makes a chemical <laughs> reaction and out pops uh, hydrogen and you fill the balloons and you send it off 
with an antenna attached to it. What? You can make like hydrogen out of salt water? The I water don't know is... what. No, uh, the salt water is probably just a catalyst for this reaction. Okay. What? But if you follow very closely, there's like a two second clip of this in the original documentary from 51. A couple of years ago, I bought one of these uh, balloons. There's, uh, they're sold in tin cans. They were produced in 1943, American made. And I opened the tin can, put uh, air into the balloon and it's still hanging over the Contiki route today. What? That's yeah. crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a rubber balloon that you could fill with air. And yeah, you would think the rubber packed. would crack. Things were no, just made better was, back then. Uh, it was packed. Yeah. That's why you buy a fridge from the 50s because they're, they're bulletproof. <laughs> Still works, yeah. Yeah. In the movie, they, they show Morse code, though, as far as communication goes. and It would go a lot farther, I think. Yeah, I never understood how Morse code works as far as how you get reception and how you're actually able to communicate back and forth. Like I, I know because that, that came before a lot of methods of communication. I never grasped how that works. I, I don't think it's different than ordinary radio. It's just the way that the signal is much sharper, so it's easier to distinguish. Mm. That's my belief. Because the mm -hmm. radio signals where which you attach the signal to just bounce up in the atmosphere and then bounces back down and then up again into the atmosphere. So it travels. Uh, so so it's a signal carried by a carrier beam. Okay. But uh, still using antennas. Have you seen 4th of July, the, the movie? No. No? <laughs> they explain that. <laughs> all right. For all those that want to look into Morse code, yeah. check out 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. uh, so, so the Morse code is just making a very sharp, audible signal, I believe. Okay. Uh, it, it, I mean, I'm not an expert. So I might be be wrong. Uh, the interesting part is that um, uh, the Contiki expedition was kind of um, one of the many phenomena that made uh, radio amateurs go alive, ham radio operators, and they were trying to contact contact route. Uh, so it kind of spawned the interest in uh, in uh, telegraph. Interesting. Let's talk about in the movie at least and in in every survival out at sea book i've read what's that one that they ended up making a movie about out at it to uh unbroken that was an incredible book because they actually talk about being surrounded with sharks in their raft and at mm -hmm. one point and yeah at one point they're out at sea in their survival raft right because their plane crashed and they thought they're getting rescued but it turns out it was a japanese enemy aircraft so, like, you know, they're dying. They're, at this point, they've been out, I think, for at least a month. And the the plane comes down and swoops and actually shoots at the raft and makes three passes. And wow. I forget the Italian, like, Olympic runner at the time. He, like, and then the whole crew jump in the water. But they were so depleted of energy that most of the crew couldn't get back in. So he helps them back in. And he's the only one that keeps jumping out of this raft for the three passes because he, he didn't want to get shot. Everyone ended up, die like, surviving in the raft he, he but he was the only one that jumped out just in case and every time he would jump out he would talk about battling these sharks because the sharks were just always there circling the raft so he would jump out as the japanese aircraft was shooting at them and while bullets are flying into the water he's also he describes kicking a shark i think punching a shark just to keep him off then getting back in the raft and repeating that process like twice that's a tough guy yeah, that's it's one of the craziest stories I've, I've heard. We'll have him on the podcast. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, in the movie, there's there's a lot of sharks. And what I'm saying is it seems like every time there's somebody adrift or a boat adrift or survival type situation like this, yeah, sharks tend to accumulate. Is there much yeah. in the logs about sharks being an issue? Yeah. The first thing I would say is that uh, the, the, when you read the logbook, it, it's eye-catching the description of the marine life itself. I mean, they, they say, see tuna fish, and it's like skulls of thousands upon thousands of tunas that you, you kind of stand on the raft, and as far as you can see, you can see activity of tunas, and it's part of one big skull. Uh, and they see skulls of hundreds of sharks passing the raft, both sharks and pilot fish found the raft uh, pleasant, so they stayed with it. 
So they kind, kind of swam with the raft uh, across the Pacific. Uh, and this was, uh, they, they kind of followed the Humboldt current. So there was uh, at times a lot of shards. They had some problems when, when they were trying to bait, stuff like that. <laughs> they always had to have a, have a watch out, a look out. But the real problem was when their parrot was called Logita. That's right. They had a parrot on the boat, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. She was cursing in Norwegian, but that's okay. <laughs> what would she say? Uh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> if you were to uh, translate anyway. it, if you were to translate it in American uh, terms, in more politeness, like what what was she saying? It's no no polite light way to say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in Norway, curse words is is made out of sexual activity. Right. Yeah. So, As many yeah. languages. Anyway, uh, it fell. <laughs> It kind of um, uh, swooped down from the mast, probably over the sea to to just take a take a um, trip, kind of. And uh, a shark jumped up and bite it, and, and uh, it disappeared, got killed. And the the guys reacted uh, strongly and started fishing sharks. So they had. Uh, at least 20 sharks at one time, which is today you would never have done that because <laughs> sharks themselves are, are victims today in a way. Yeah, they are. But, but the interesting part is that they, they learn how to fish at least the small sharks with their hands, which is quite outstanding. How do they do that? You, you just make the sharks swim close enough to the raft because the raft is sitting on the water. So if you're sitting on the main logs at the stern, you're basically having water washing above your feet. Mm -hmm. So you hold out a piece of fish or something and make the shark uh, grab for it, kind of go up almost out of the water. And then when it turns around, you grab the tail and then as much as possible, you lift it up and then turn it around over the log. And sharks has a reflex. Different sharks have different reflexes. You can reflex if you touch it in a specific spot or these sharks, if you turn it upside down, it will just go numb. So when it's numb, you, you have the possibility of dragging it even further in. And once the shark get more- um, Horizontal. Horizontal, it will wake up. The, the, and then it will use its muscle to swim away. The problem is most of its body is now on the raft. So it would just take a salto back into the raft. Um, so that's how you fish a shark with your hands. Uh, and then you have to get away because, <laughs> yeah. See, that's interesting because that, that part of the movie, at least, I, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's just like yeah. a, that's a Hollywood part of it. And I, I, I was thinking, okay, that's just a well, little, that's, it's not that, far, it's not possible, but I didn't think that was, that happened. If you watch the original documentary, you will see that. But of course, the, the, the shark in the movie, in the 2012 movie is maybe four times larger than they Right. Did. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really just expanded. And, and um, the movie, they, they actually recorded it with a silicone shark. Oh, did they? Uh, and then they found out, no, that doesn't look right. So they made a digital shark on top of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, hmm. It's really gigantic, gigantic. But I liked, I liked how they, they've made it in the movie because the parrot dies and you could see the man just yeah. c controlled but vengeful. Yeah. Right, like immediately he's like, that shark's now gonna die, <laughs> and he just follows the shark around, <laughs> keeps eyeing it, doesn't lose, doesn't lose eye contact with it, and then when he gets his opportunity, just grabs the thing and pulls it in. Uh, That's pretty and fun. That, that that is the guy who is the highest decorated Norwegian oh, okay. soldier. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. You see, and he actually looks a bit like him. So. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. So there are shark incidents. Is there any close calls with sharks or marine life? No. No. Not not as they they don't write about that. 
There uh, is an accident, kind of. Uh, 17th of May is a Norwegian holiday. It's um, like part of July in Norway. And they had a party and uh, they almost lost their only compass uh, because people weren't uh, walking carefully enough. <laughs> Uh, so alcohol was um, banned from then on. <laughs> was it banned? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Uh, at least that amount of alcohol. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> so 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 the 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 closest call they had was uh, when they reached shore. Because they. Yeah couldn't control they tried to steer and they they sailed it past at least two islands because they wanted to get behind the island because the the the, the humble current the, the pacific is really tough waves and crushing in i mean one time i was in the marquesas and i went to the village to to make some shopping and i saw this beautiful small beach like five six meters of coral sand and it's like why is nobody swimming here? And I just put my sack down, took off my clothes and jumped into the sea. And in Norway, when you, there's waves, you, you like swimming into them, you know, because it's commotion and fun. And I did that here and the wave just picked me up and boom, on the beach. <laughs> it's that powerful. I mean, so, so they, they try to, get in behind the islands uh, and um, sail. Because uh, most of the coral islands of Tumutus, they have a surrounding coral reef. Mm -hmm. And the coral reef is sharp. So if you're thrown against it, uh, you would just rip the skin off. Mm. Uh, so they were trying to steer. Uh, they couldn't. And then the wind turned, and they were just facing main part of the, the island, the last island, Raroy. And they knew that it would crash right into the reef. And they didn't know whether the, the raft would survive. They didn't know what would happen. They sent out a signal and uh, <laughs> made the preparations. And uh, each found a spot where he was most comfortable <laughs> holding on to something. Uh, and the raft was uh, actually heading with, with uh, the stern first. Because oh, they no. try to, yeah, they were trying to put out an anchor, but it actually just turned the raft around and um, it headed stern first. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know the power of the waves. Heyerdahl, he he was standing in the front of the raft, so everyone saw when he appeared. <laughs> I mean the the. The coral reef is sitting like a barrier, you know, with maybe 60 centimeters above the, um, the, the water. Yep. And then you just hit it. Boom. And then all the power of the wave just keeps going. And uh, you have a wall of, uh, Heira was covered with eight feet at least of uh, seawater. And that pressure of the total amount of, of the ocean just pounding on your body. And he was trying to hang on in a rope. And luckily he had turned the rope around his hand, not just trying to hold it because he was just trying to hold it. He would have been um, taken off the rope. So the movie's really accurate. I, even that part, I was like, okay, well, this is far-fetched, yeah. but was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the point about the seven waves and, uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they actually borrowed a piece of equipment, which they throw out in the anchor. Okay. We have a replica of the radio set, which mm. they borrowed. Okay. And I said, don't put this in water. No, 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 no. It's just for the studio. <laughs> and then I was invited to the film premiere and I saw somebody was throwing this overboard. So of course, after the movie, I went to the set director and said, why? You promised <laughs> me not to. No, no, that was digital. <laughs> it was like drinking. Oh, no, it was digital. And I got it back two months later, and it was like rusted. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a, funny, that's a funny set director, though. No, no, that's fine. It was just, just yeah, CGI. It's CGI. 
Ah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> go away, go away, museum man. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, so 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 most of that is accurate. Yes. Again, there were 101 days out at sea, and they traveled over 4,000 nautical miles. So we discussed before this interview a little bit about like survival tactics that they employed. Um, and you said that potentially some were even used in military survival guides still used yeah. to this day. So w what are some of the survival tactics that they developed out there or used? The, the, the main thing I uh, remember is uh, they tested how much seawater you can blend into water uh, in order to survive. It's about 30%. You can... And yeah, and remember, this is under certain circumstances with a lot of sun. It's a hot climate, and over long periods of time. And this was actually Hero himself who tested. Hmm. Um, they also tested the survival equipment, which the most of the equipment from used on the the expedition was from the U.S. War Department. Okay. Which is a very honest name, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they had like shark powder, mm. which they were supposed to test uh, for sharks. Uh, it was not recommended. They tested uh, rations, of course. They tested, uh, they had uh, like uh, safety suits. You know, today you have suits you can put on, you can survive arctic sea for 48 hours almost huh? okay. without big problems they watertight these were simpler versions which they tested out uh, some of them during the, the landing wait what are these suits these are for for it, it, it's like dry suits basically okay yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, for survival basically uh, so long -term to, survival in sea okay to survive the coldness of the water yeah. right so, so they tested a lot of that kind of equipment uh, and then they tested different uh, responses to to sun exposure and uh, to yeah well there's a lot that right there that i want to dissect so let's start with the water so 30 percent salt water is what herdal was experimenting with and i've never heard of this yeah. what did he report was his ego just inflating the fact that it was fine or is that still to this date a scientific fact that you can consume 30% water? I do believe water? this is cited in official survival guides for the U.S. military at the time. And I've seen it as late as 2010. There was okay. a former U.S. Um, SEAL who wrote the survival guide. Can't remember the, the name of the book, okay. which quoted... Um, this fact and a couple others from the Kontiki expedition. So they did write reports and, and Hero loved to do experiments like this uh, his whole life. He, he liked to have fun and uh, see what happened when he tested out. Uh, I mean, it runs in the family. I worked with his um, grandson. Uh, he, he helped us construct several of the exhibitions in the museum. And we were outside and we have like a museum on the other part of the street, which is built like this. It's 30 meters to the top. And he was like, oh, is it possible for me to, to climb up? <laughs> and he did, like with no security rope. And <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's kind of, it's, it's the nature of the guy who, who mm -hmm. test out. But Heyerdahl was also very detailed in recording the effects of these things. I mean, he was accurate. So, so, and- um, What did he report about the water? No, the only thing I know is that he reported that it's up to 30% uh, seawater you can mix in with the fresh water mm. and you have no reaction. And it's not, it would be a more positive solution of conserving water. Because I know like it, typically if you drink in seawater, it will dehydrate you at an exponentially yeah. quicker rate. But if you use 30%, potentially you're actually conserving your water a little more so you can make it last a little longer. Yeah, I think he, he says something about uh, the climate. This was 
uh, in the middle of the Pacific, uh, around the equator, it's really hot, you're sweating. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that it's recorded that if you don't sweat, you would have to reduce the amount of seawater because it's an amount of salt that your body can take. Um, okay. But I don't know. I, I'm not the, the survival type guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's still very interesting. So let's let's go on to the shark powder. I have heard of that. I don't think it's quite like utilized or modern or, or that my, effective my guess is that it went out of development after the Contiki expedition because I never heard about it since. Right. Okay. Uh, it so, didn't work uh, and they didn't uh, get it to work. And the same similar circumstance, they, they tested a new, new set of rations that were developed after the Second World War, 1946. And the Contiki was the first big major field test for these rations. And the bread uh, was completely discontinued after the reports from the expedition. What was wrong with it? Um, it was in tin cans. Uh, it turned out that the, it could develop botulism, I think. What is it? Uh, botulism. It's a um, poisonous substance. Is if it rots in a specific way, it produces a very dangerous substance. Like oh, if you have um, salted fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you do that and you do it in the wrong way, it, it will, could potentially kill you if you eat it. But yeah. also, I think mostly it was the report was not very positive for the taste. And <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, they sustained themselves on biscuits. Yeah, okay. And two of these guys had to live on rations for the whole 101 days. So they only had rations and water. Mm. The rest of the crew actually ate mostly fish okay. uh, during the expedition. Yeah, what were those? You said two of the guys were, yeah. their duty was supply. It's a, it's a way you can cut fish, certain kind of fish. You can cut them and in the skin, water with uh, i mean the, the fish contains a certain amount of liquid and it would pour into the wound and you can drink that wow yeah it's, mm. i don't remember the fish name of the fish though <laughs> interesting so you are you saying they were using these fish for hydration as well no they were testing it to see if oh, it okay. was and then it was uh, like detailed reports on uh, you know which kind of fish and how much fish they were in the ocean. Um, uh, there were detailed reports in the weather because um, they didn't really have any good weather data from this area in the Pacific. And that's actually part of the climate weather database today. So it still survives. Oh, cool. Well, one of the things when you were describing the sea life that saddens me a little bit is the current sea states, you know, people are seeing these documentaries like Sea Spiracy and just just the reports on fisheries now. Yeah, the oceans are much more depleted. And can you just only imagine in, in during this expedition in 1947 how much more sea life was out there? And, and not to mention that they're right on the water, not above it like in a typical boat. They're right flush with the water, seeing and interacting with this marine life it must have been a whole and, and the world. marine life was following the rod so That's so right. pilot fish that usually swim with sharks they were abandoning the sharks and swam with um well in parts of the pacific there were flying fish and that's uh, right. very common in expeditions because it glides through the here and it landed sometimes it landed on the raft uh, and it couldn't get off again so breakfast <laughs> <laughs> the, the most devastating is probably the sharks i mean in 1947 there were so many sharks around in Contiki that they didn't think twice about fishing and and killing 20 sharks yeah after after the uh, incident with the parrot uh, but his grandson was actually sailing the same route in 2006 and they saw only four sharks along the whole trip. Oh my God. 
Yeah. Oh. So they, they were sailing a little bit farther south because the Contiki followed the Humboldt Current because they were drifting, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, expedition 2006, the Tangagua, uh, were sailing. So they were a bit farther south, so that would account for some of it, but not all of it. Mm. Um, what was in that shark powder? Do you know? No. At the time? No. <laughs> no. Mm. Uh, you could probably find out, uh, but uh, no. Um, uh, so anything else as far as survival tactics before we move forward? Uh, no. No, uh, okay. Not, not, not that I remember. Uh, I okay. Mean, they had, they, they did have um, uh, a series of tests uh, with, with um, no, forget it. I, I can't really. Uh, okay. Speak, speak too much about it. Say it. No, yeah. I, I don't, don't remember the details, the mm -hmm. clarity. So, yeah, no worries. Um, so let, let's get into like the crew dynamics a little bit. Was there, you know, you said he selected his crew very wisely. He was very yeah. methodical about choosing them. But was there nevertheless a little drama out there? Was there any type of tensions in between any crew members? Anything like that happen? It's secret. <laughs> Actually, it is. They, they never recorded it. Okay. And they had a, a kind of deal not to talk about it. Um, but the fact that all of them remain close friends for the rest of their lives, I don't think it was any serious incidents. The one recorded incident is kind of fun. The, the, the guy who became the director here and it was the, the decorated soldier, he liked to sing. And uh, the rest of the crew didn't think he could. <laughs> so he was chased out the mast at one time and he had to sit, sit in the mast if he was going to sing. <laughs> And it's like 30 years after the expedition, he had uh, made copies of like, you know, when you got a scorecard from school yeah. and he had music in school and it was like a note that uh, his music teacher wrote that he sings excellently or something. And he had made copies of that and sent around to the other crew members to... <laughs> Prove that he was a good singer. Well, that's and then cool. uh, then uh, a couple of them were smoking. Uh, camel, in fact. Um, They're smoking the, camel. Yeah, uh, the 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 ration packs uh, so for the American soldiers oh. contain uh, camel cigarettes. Okay, I thought like yeah. that. <laughs> that, that took me too long at first. I was like, they're smoking camels. <laughs> yeah, but okay, no. they're smoking camel cigarettes. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yeah, oh, yeah. smoking cigarette, and yeah. that was not very popular because the raft was quite incendiary. I mean, it's easy to set on fire, mm. and especially this other radio guy was smoking constantly and was just dropping the cigarettes in between the logs, and there was a bit of commotion from mm. that, as far as I understood. What do you mean by commotion? Uh, yelling, I suppose. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Because because of what? Because the cigarette smokers were doing what? The the the, the other radio operator he hated smoke, never oh, smoked. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, he also had anti smoke campaigns later in life, oh. uh, and uh, he was really upset, and he didn't want. Uh, I mean, the, the cabin, you can't see it because of the sail, but it's like four by three meters or something. And if you're sitting on eight hours watches, listening to the radio and smoking the whole time, <laughs> even if the roof is gone on half of the hut, when it was not raining, they, they, they removed the roof, it's still gonna, you will notice. <laughs> that's still pretty uh, forward. Like that's, that's futuristic of him not to like cigarettes because everyone was smoking back in those days, right? That was like yeah. cigarette time where everyone and anyone was smoking cigarettes. So that's yeah. kind of cool that he was anti-smoking at that time. Yeah. yeah, he was going against the current. Um, he, he was smart as well. He, he yeah. understood why what it would do to the body. So Interesting. it was not like that he didn't 
didn't mind people smoking, but one, he didn't like the smell. And secondly, he assumed that it was dangerous. Interesting. Because at that point, the research hadn't quite come out that much. So he just intuitively Not at all. figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I forget, though, like as far as survival goes, was there any issues with sun damage and, and sun protection? Because you tend to get like blisters out there and stuff like that. They had sun cream and sunglasses. Okay. Uh, Army supplied. So they didn't seem to have any issues with that. It, mm. It's not reported in any way, mm. uh, any serious issues. They had issues with cuts. Uh, when it's damp, it, it doesn't really grow that well. Mm -hmm. But uh, no issues like that. And uh, basically, one guy said that after the first two weeks, it was like, it was like a cruise on a cruise boat <laughs> yeah. until yeah. We, we reached uh, the main island. And it, it was quite uneventful. That's what they say. I, I mean, it's kind of a joke because it wasn't. Uh, but uh, the one guy, he, he, had, um, he had survived a lot of, um, you know, undercover action during the war and the raids. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, if he hadn't gone on the Contiki, he, he probably would have lost it after the war. Wow. It, it was like um, uh, how do you say that? It, it was like uh, for the soul, in a way. You know? Healing. Healing. Mm. Yeah. For, the, for the mind and for the soul. Yeah. And, that's uh, a lot of, that's why people often do go in these challenging environments is to heal their minds and sometimes it's to distract which could be something that's not necessarily healthy but at least it it gets you sometimes it just gives you a new perspective it challenges you and lets you reconnect and then and then yeah gives you something to live for um yeah so so he he was also part of um you know secret intelligence work mm. uh, we have a lot of installations sponsored by the NSA in America. And he was heading up that in the 50s, I think. Uh, and um, he also constructed two museums, uh, the Contiki Museum and uh, a museum about uh, the resistance uh, during the war. Oh. And then at one time I asked him like, uh, why did you shift from, from being an army guy or Air Force guy, actually, but, but from um, military to, to museum? And he said, it's my, my contributions for world peace. Uh, I had to kind of make amends. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Because you, so, cause you got you get to meet some of these individuals. Yeah, I met um, three of them. Heyerdahl, uh, briefly couple of times then uh, the director the first director of the museum the, um, uh, the guy who didn't like smoking I met him several times uh, and then the Swedish guy who the uh, ethnologist I met him on Tahiti where mm -hmm. he settled eventually any memorable moments or traits of character that you thought were interesting in meeting them yeah, with especially the, the guy who became the director, you could so easily see why he was suitable for the role. He was composed. He was totally dedicated to, to everything he, he engaged in. And he was also a guy who, who could um, tell anyone to, to piss off if they... <laughs> if they Cross this way, so to speak. Okay. But, but it's not what he said uh, because I had just a nice conversation with him. But you could instantly feel that. I also met uh, a couple of crew members from Dra, hmm. especially an American called Norman Baker. When I met him, he was 83 years old. The year before, he had broken his neck while. Uh, horseback ride <laughs> yeah. and he was uh, galloping you know when you gallop on a track oh, yeah. and you, yeah. jump with the horse in. jumped uh, in the water over the water 
Mm. And uh, the horse didn't make it. And he kind of just flew away. And he heard something break. He heard the sound. And he was touching his body. And no, my fingers are okay. My arms are okay. My legs are okay. So he got up, put the horse back in the stable, went to the car and drove home, went to bed because he was kind of sore. The next day he woke up and couldn't move his legs. Oh my God. And he spent almost two hours just massaging his legs and dragging them onto the floor and forcing himself up and drove to the doctor. And the doctor ordered, uh, you know, CAT scan or a Runkin. And once he saw that, he came in and took his car keys and said, you know, you're lucky. If you had kind of had a situation while, while you were driving, you had the situation on the right and you just turned your head too abruptly, it would have snapped the rest of your neck. So, <laughs> Pull up. Pull up. And that was one year before I met him and we went on a cruise. He was lecturing on a cruise boat. Mm-hmm. And the week before he had flown across America on his own plane, uh-huh. 83 years old. He was lifting weights every day. Do you think these men were different at the time? I, to me, in my perspective, I see him kind of as gentlemen and just maybe not stronger physically because I think we've adapted as humans, but stronger minded. Do you think that's possible? Hero was, definitely. He kind of trained his will, I think. He exposed himself to, to, to pain and, and um, he trained his stamina, of course, physical and mentally. So he was very much different, I think. And he went on to kind of become a world citizen and uh, one, one of the Jews, one of the great stories, you know, in the 20th century. The others were just, they were, none of them were ordinary. I mean, all of them were exceptional at school, not in all subjects, but in certain subjects. They were uh, successful after the voyage as artists or as businessmen or as during the military career. But I think the main characteristic is that they didn't want to be different. Like the guy I talked about, the director, he participated in a very famous, uh, famous um, sabotage action during the war, where they, in Norway, they produced what they called heavy water, which you can make an atomic bomb, nuclear weapon from. Mm-hmm. And the Allied believed that uh, the Nazis were doing research on this. So they ordered uh, people to destroy the factory first by airplanes, it didn't work. So they sent in um, sabotage teams and he was part of that. And um, he was um, very famous for that. Uh, he and, and the whole group after the war. Mm. But when people began writing about this in the eighties um, uh, and he, he actually went down to the newspaper editor with research, recent research showing that no, the Nazis didn't have uh, enough research to make an A-bomb. So, the, so he, he, he confronted the journalist and said, don't write this ad anymore. I wasn't a hero. <laughs> uh, the, 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 we thought that they were doing this, but they weren't. So we weren't very important. We weren't instrumental in deciding the war. And so you, don't, you shouldn't write this. You should write the true story. Mm. So that's more what I kind of take away from this, that these people, they, they wanted to be normal. And most of them succeeded in that one. The other radio guy, he never succeeded. I mean, I told you about how he connected to the German antenna when he sent his radio message. Mm-hmm. And he could only do that because he was, had no nerves, no conscience, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, I mean, everyone I uh, talked to who know, knew him said he was a wonderful human being, but he was never able to settle down after the war. Mm. So he tried to be normal, uh, couldn't, and um, he died during an um, attempt to, to reach the North Pole. Yeah. Uh, undramatically, though, he died of a heart attack. It was too cold and 
he had strained his body too much. Mm. But um, yeah, he seemed like the the adventure addict, the the person yeah, that never settled basically. down. To, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. incredible. Um, yeah, and I, I yeah. think I think this goes to show, like, yeah, there's a lot of honor in in those men and those stories, like not wanting that to be published. And I do think there was, it was a different breed. It was a different type of person and like of course it was a different time i mean yeah it was a serious time yeah not to mention you're saying it it more than likely was eventful but the fact that they come back with such they probably had pride and honor and 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 in a sense just that ability to not have the drama because they were just a different breed of person so in the end the expedition was just s- s- extremely successful and sometimes when it's extremely successful it makes it less uh not interesting but less <laughs> drama filled right like um, yeah because because it's it's so successful they, they nailed it they nailed a feat that was incredible and you would think it almost impossible at the time and then they did it well so yeah yeah. The 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 I think when it comes to Tor Hero, you you see a, a, a slightly different story. I mean, he had an incredible stamina. He had uh, just the day he decided to do the expedition, he was staying at a, a posh hotel in Washington that uh, he was um, uh, going to have a Christmas party with the Norwegian embassy and they booked a hotel room that what they would consider normal for him. Uh, it was way out, out of his league. He had like $26, $27 left in his pocket. The hotel room bill was for like 40 <laughs> And he decided to do the Kantiki expedition. I mean, he had resources back home, but he hadn't access to them. Mm. So that's that mindset. And after the expedition, he had about $45,000 in debt, which he had borrowed and loaned from friends and other people. And he determined that I will pay every cent back. And uh, for the next four years, he was constantly traveling, lecturing, selling books. And that kind of effort, uh, that's a story that rarely told because it's not dramatic it's like sitting on uh, trains uh, across the u.s to to deliver lectures and you don't have time to book a hotel room because you have to travel between <laughs> writing articles and writing books and, and promoting and um, making it i mean he could easily have been forgotten but some very clever people helped him sell the book and sell the documentary i mean the documentary film he filmed himself the first, uh, basically the first film he filmed and uh, the, the, the companies, uh, he wanted the people to make a, a really nice documentary, but uh, the films were so, uh, were shaking and they said, okay, we pay you $250 for world rights to this material and put it in use segments. He said, no, I'd rather make it myself. And he made a lecture film. Then he met some uh, people that uh, helped him make movie theater film and it got incredibly successful and i have this uh, photo where you can see it's a long queue outside the cinema and on top it's like contiki mm. and uh, below it's walt disney beaver valley <laughs> <laughs> interesting no way yeah, yeah so, so cool. it's also that part of the story uh, one thing is doing the expedition but you also need to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he was good at both. What was the result? So he did prove that in fact, it was possible to take a balsa wood raft, the one behind you across 4,000 miles. He proved that it was possible to leave and they left from Peru all the way to this this Polynesian island. But did it prove that that was something that occurred did scientific researchers kind of agree or no uh today we we agree that the polynesians sail in double canoes from the west we know in fact that they came from the south tip of taiwan the language 
of the Polynesians came from the south tip of Taiwan. The people came from the islands just a bit east of New Guinea. And the culture is uh, it's like an amalgamated culture. It's uh, different elements bounded together. So no, he wasn't correct. He, he did prove that it was possible. And um, it's a scientific discipline called maritime experimental archeology, span which makes experiments with um, the watercrafts in order to test how they function and um, how you should sail them, which is mainly inspired by Herald's work. So that's the result. And then not the expedition itself, but the success of the expedition and the imagination of the, the public, general public that thought, ah, oh, he did it, he must be right. It um, kind of uh, inspired researchers to new, new research. So it's a lot of research that has been made in order to prove it all wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of his uh, lasting legacy. In addition to the fact that he, he went on several archaeological expeditions. He, he brought out the first modern archaeological expedition to, to Easter Island, to Rapa Nui. Uh, and a lot of what you know about their prehistory is, is uh, the legacy of that expedition. So today we know that um, about 2-3% of the Polynesian DNA is from South America. Personally, I believe that it was the Polynesian that sailed to South America. To me, it makes the most sense because mm -hmm. they were sailors, they were navigators, and they frequently crossed distances with over 2,000 kilometers sailed to Hawaii and back to Tahiti and stuff like that. It's incredible expeditions, even more incredible than the Contiki. But we, we, we don't know because just last year, there was an expert um, DNA research that concluded they found South American DNA in the Polynesian population and they thought that it could give evidence that some South Americans had made it to the Marquesas. Interesting. So it's still not settled. That's the incredible part. Yeah. You know, it's 70 years ago and still not settled. I thought America was mostly populated during the Great Ice Age though through I, th I thought from the north and then they traveled from north to south. Is that not how like South America was mostly populated? No, oh, that's correct. Uh, yeah. uh, almost all of the DNA variation you found in South America is, or in North America is uh, rather close. Mm -hmm. It seems like the one founding population, but there are some minor differences. I don't know the story behind them, but this new study from last year could pinpoint the part of the DNA that they found in the po uh, Polynesian populations of the Marquesas could be pinpointed to an area in Colombia, north of Colombia. Uh, so to a, to a rather small area, they, they could say it was not Peru, for instance. So, but how they can do that, I don't know. But there's uh, slight variations in some populations, but the main part of the American migrations happened during the, after the ice age and down the whole yeah. continent. Yeah. Right. So. Hmm. But it would be unfair to say that prehistoric man didn't travel. I think people would have come from Africa in reed boats. Uh, I don't think they would, uh, you know, make big marks or contribute to the main part of the culture. But I don't see if, when you see the, 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 the migration pattern in Polynesia or in the Pacific, not only Polynesia, Pacific, people crisscrossing, you, you find DNA from all over the place. Mm. It would be impossible, almost impossible for me to conceive that they didn't sail into South America. And if they did that, uh, why would you think that the Africans didn't <laughs> go into boats and, and uh, got caught by the current or, or wanted to discover what's behind the horizons and sail to America. But clearly it wasn't many. Mm. We, we know that because of the DNA. Mm. But it's quite strange for me that 
uh, or I believe strongly that people would have done that. So, yeah. It seems like like a suicide mission. Like <laughs> what kind of crazy prehistoric adventurers would do something like that? But, you know, humans, yeah, there was just no way of recording it as easily back then. So who's to say? Right. Um, and I think when you look at the technology uh, and the knowledge, it was oftentimes greater than we think today. We, we, we have the, um, just thinking about Columbus, I mean, the technology between Columbus and the Polynesian sailor isn't that great. What made a difference was later European travels when they figured out time and they could navigate it not only sailing and surviving, but they could say that in two weeks time, we will be there on the map. And in four weeks, we will be at this city because they could navigate. Mm. And that was major, but, but the Polynesians could do that 1500 years earlier. Not oh. just as accurate, of course, but still, I mean. It's incredible. So the knowledge is greater than we, tend to think yeah indigenous people are ingenious in most ways I think. Mm. and that was Heyerdahl's main point that you could learn from prehistory i mean you always thought that people were the same they would experience the nature the same that's why he went on expeditions to if he went up on the mountain slope and ski down he could experience the same nature and the same forces that people a thousand years earlier had done. And the same with this balsa wood raft. He knew that a thousand years before people have sailed this balsa wood raft along the coast of America. And he, by sailing it, he experienced the same ways of handling it. Mm. Thanks so much for uh, coming on. I think for all those tuning in on youtube it could be good let's check out what you got but yeah radar thank you so much for coming on how can people find you or or learn a, more if they want to research about the kontiki best be, best way to go to our website kon slash tiki dot no great i'll put the link down uh for the podcasters listening and on youtube for all those uh watching thank you so yeah thanks so much for for coming on and yeah let's check out this raft great talk to this is the raft and the whole raft is a traditional, except from the, the, the boards in the bow here. Yeah, and then the front. So the, the, it was just logs extending out. So there was no yeah. like sides like this, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that decorated military guy, the director, he insisted upon it. And the only result was that it slowed the raft down. Okay. <laughs> no effect. <laughs> so you're saying, wait, so you're saying they did sail with that board? on yeah they did oh, okay okay so but you're saying it wasn't not traditional to have that no you just okay. had um had the logs sticking yeah. out as you said mm -hmm. and when they recreated the voyage in 2006 that's exactly what they did and they sailed faster mm. cool so yeah i don't know if you can see the um, the shoes in front here yeah that's bit. where Herdal stood when he crashed on the reef. Ah, cool. Wow. And he was uh, hanging on to the rope. Hang on. <laughs> he had to be at the front of the lines. Yeah. Here's the, um, the hut. Here you see the, the only way they had to make food. It was a box with a gas stove. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had um, must have had a lot of gas boxes. Yeah, Can't traditional see. American equipment. Here you can see some of them. Well, you see the camel, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. you see the chewing gum. Yeah, the candy. Yeah, and the biscuits. And the most popular thing on the, the raft was uh, hot chocolate. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And they had safety equipment. You can see um, life vests. 
from yep. the U.S. Coast Guards, actually. That's funny. Uh, I was in the Coast Guard. <laughs> you were? Yeah. Uh, I was in the U.S. Coast Guard, yeah. And here, you probably... Oh, there it is, yeah. There's the balloon. Yeah. So that's the balloon you purchased that uh, they would fill yeah. with with hydrogen from ocean. Is it like from ocean pressure or something, right? No, they had had a box of chemicals. Uh, oh, one right. end they put in the ocean, yeah. and out on the other side got the hydrogen. I don't know how they yeah. make that, but uh, I'm just Other impressed radio. that the balloon still. It was made in 1943. Right. Yeah. And I could just take it out, and it was exactly yeah there you see where they used to fish sharks oh yeah, yeah. of course and i don't know but uh, the knife sticking up there is a k-bar okay cool that's a navy seals weapon oh cool which is often used to to commit asylum killing i suppose Oh, jeez, okay. <laughs> uh, this was the place, uh, uh, this director, how, oh, here you can see him. See the people? The crew? Oh, cool. This is the, the first director. Yeah. Um, this is the other radio guy. Uh, it's a business guy. He almost drowned. He... he he uh, was taking a swim and uh, the raft was uh, sailing too fast. Uh. And, um, this guy, he grabbed a life vest and a rope and just went overboard wow. and rescued him. Yeah. yeah, and that's Harold, of course, the Swedish anthropologist. And that's the navigator. <laughs> Oh, there's, oh, sorry. Here's the other side of the raft. And you see the, um, the lifeboat. Life yeah. It's one important thing I have to tell you. This is about half the size of uh, the original one. Mm -hmm. I tried to buy original one, but uh, you couldn't find it. I mean, that kind of rubber is uh, gone. I tried to buy boats that uh, were looking like the, the life uh, raft, but uh, I wasn't allowed to import them into Norway because they didn't um, satisfy the, the, the safety requirements for boats. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. So I had to put up this little thing just to, to show people. Unfortunately, there were some Chinese people here uh, who took measurements of the raft and uh, put out a model. And they also thought that this was the original size of the lifeboat, which is too bad. So how long have you worked in the museum? Uh, since 2006. And what, what keeps you passionate about the subject Can of the Kantiki? Can you see this? Oh, what? There's an Oscar? <laughs> 1951, best documentary. Whoa. Yeah. That's amazing. Made by this camera. I don't know. It's the lightest bounce. So. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. I haven't seen an Oscar. What makes me passionate? I mean, um, some, uh, some years ago, I was sitting at work and they were calling from the museum shop and said that um, Shushenko is sitting down here. Like Shushenko? Yeah, the Ukrainian president is just sitting on the stairs. You should come and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> and he was um, in Norway in some official business. And uh, he went out here as um, private citizens to see the boat. The same with the, with the president of French Polynesia. Uh, we got a phone one day and like, do you have some time? Yeah, sure. Here you see the president of French Polynesia would like to come and see your archives. Uh, or the ex-president of the Maldives or other people like you mm -hmm. meet. Like mm -hmm. the guy I met on the bus, American. I went to work about two hours before the museum. It was a summer day. And this was almost two hours before the museum 
opened. And it was this guy walking around, talking to all of the passengers. And he came to me and it's like, I'm going to the Contiki Museum today. And he was so excited. He knew that the museum was opening in two hours, but he couldn't sit in his hotel room. He had seen the film. He was like 10 years old when the film was made. And his wife, she was sitting way in the back because she was, I'm not associated with this man. <laughs> so, you know, passion that, uh, that makes your own passion. Of course, the Contiki had also a huge impact on popular culture. If you ever been to a tiki bar, uh, the tiki bar concept, of course, developed in, in uh, California in the 20s after the First World War. But the reason why it got popular throughout the world was the Contiki expedition. Hmm. And have you ever read Donald Duck? Uh, I have not read Donald Duck, no. <laughs> when I was a young kid, it was a comic book that came once a week right so every tuesday we've got stories with donald duck and mickey mouse and there's a and this is donald a story duck. with the donald duck as hero no way yeah. original movie posters they knew how to make them back in the 50s huh? yeah it was such a different cover photo for sure thanks so much any parting words for future adventurous and that they could learn from from this incredible incredible historical feat use it as an opportunity to get to know, know new people not only bring your friends always bring new people along and i think that um, like any adventure i mean uh, adventure is the normal state of human beings i mean when you're a kid you always want to go around the corner of the house or over the hilltop or, you know, catch the train or the bus somewhere to see something new. And the people who go on adventure is the people who could preserve that kind of natural state, the, the young self. Uh, people grow older and they get responsibilities, so they deny themselves the pleasure of going on adventure. Mm. But we shouldn't, if you have the opportunity. Maybe you can even do as a um, French couple who run an old pension in Paris many years ago. They didn't have uh, time to go on a venture because they were running this pension together. But every Sunday, they took the day off and they walked along one street of Paris. Mm. And throughout their life, they saw the whole Paris, every street. Mm. Different ventures. Keep young. Go on. Go on adventures. Thanks so much, Radar Solsvik. Um, the links Thank are you. in the bio. It was a pleasure. Excellent. Oh wow, you're still listening. Hey, why don't you leave a rating and review on the Apple Podcasts and help support the channel, or maybe subscribe? Uh, uh, you're so kind. 